ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to the Lowy Institute for International Policy. I'm Michael Fully Love, the Institute's Executive Director, and it's my great honour today to be conducting a conversation with Malcolm Fraser. Mr Fraser was Australia's 22nd Prime Minister, residing in the Lodge from 1975 until 1983, and when he retired from the Federal Parliament, he'd served as the Member for Wannan for 28 years. Prior to that, he served as Minister in the Holt, Gorton and McMahon governments. In office, Prime Minister Fraser opposed apartheid, campaigned against white minority rule in South Africa, supported multiculturalism. On the other hand, he was, I think it's fair to say, generally seen as a hawk on international affairs. His support for multiculturalism was evidenced by the establishment of the government-funded radio and television network, the Special Broadcasting Service. And here, actually, my family has a connection with you, Malcolm, because my late father, Eric Fullylove, was one of the first creative consultants that was hired under Bruce Gingell to establish SBS and to send well, him training. Good job. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> we think so. Uh, since leaving office, Mr Fraser has continued to play a role in international policy. He was, for example, co-chairman of the Commonwealth Committee of Eminent Persons in 1986 on South Africa. He served as chairman of Care Australia, president of Care International. He was a board member of ICG, um, and he's held various uh, other important international posts. He is also, as many people here know, a keen exponent of Twitter. Uh, in fact, um, I asked Mr Fraser today uh, how many followers he had on Twitter, and he said, oh, I'm not sure, about 32,000. So I think he follows it pretty closely, which is fair enough. We all follow our follower numbers closely. I asked him how he got onto Twitter, and he said, oh, well, uh, it was serving my interests better than Facebook. Um, so I, I gather he was on Facebook, and uh, his family said, look, why don't you get out of the way off Facebook and, and get on Twitter? Uh, and he, his Twitter feed makes for extremely interesting reading. He cu curates a lot of uh, very interesting articles and... and um, and flicks them on to the rest of us. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr Fraser's here today, of course, because he's published this book, Dangerous Allies, which is a provocative look um, at Australia's role in the world, and in particular... Factual, not provocative. ..the US alliance. Well, it can be factual and provocative. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Malcolm Fraser. I'm going to ask Malcolm questions, I guess, for about 20 minutes or half an hour, and then I'll, uh, then I'll go to the audience. So please have a think about questions you'd like to ask. I, mean, I want to ask you a lot of questions about the United States, about Japan, about China, but I'm going to start with a general question, if I can, Malcolm. Um, you're a former Liberal Prime Minister, but you're no longer a member of the Liberal Party. Um, and I think that when you left the Liberal Party, you said something like, the party was no longer a Liberal Party, but a Conservative Party. I think, if I'm not misquoting you, that, that you make the argument that the political scene has changed, you haven't changed your positions. Is that... Well, first of all, well, is, that, is that a correct characterisation of, of your view? And if it is, is it really true that you haven't moderated at all since you are in politics? In terms of policy in relation to Australia, how Australia should operate, multicultural society and open society and all of that, I don't think my views have changed. But uh, when you're talking about Australia in the wider world, when the strategic context in which we must live and operate as a nation changes, yep. it's very foolish not also to change and take account of those other major international changes. Mm. Now, one of the problems I've got and tried to bring out in the book is that while the strategic context has changed, our government and our opposition and the political class in Canberra um, behave as though it hasn't. So how have you changed then when it comes to Australia's role in the world? Because I think it's true to say that you were seen as a, a bit of a hawk on defence, uh, yeah. on conscription, uh, on Vietnam. How have you changed, well, do you think, in the me, last... Me, uh, um, yes, I, 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 I would have been regarded. I made a speech in 1976 in which I said that if Russia or the Soviet Union wants peace, it should work for that and demonstrate that. Mm. And then they invaded Afghanistan a few years later. Mm. Um, and this was at a time when some people in Europe were talking about detente and thought it was a reality. I thought that was always wishful thinking, and I thought it was inaccurate. Mm. Um, 
But, um, you know, Australia was a small country with few resources. The Cold War was on. The Soviet Union was real. Uh, at one point, they had a naval flotilla that circumnavigated Australia. And um, I, I, I regarded, and many people regarded, the Soviet Union as outward thrusting aggressive. And there were problems in our own part of the world. It wasn't just Europe, it wasn't just Czechoslovakia or Hungary. The uh, independence of Malaysia was delayed 10 years because of a communist insurgency. Mm. Um, then there was the PKIQ in Indonesia. So it wasn't just a question of Soviet actions far from our shores. Some things were quite close. Mm. And in those circumstances, I believe that the a policy Australia had adopted from its very birth, not federation, going back to the colonies, mm. of strategic dependence on a major power was still a valid policy. But after 1990, I thought we could have become a little more independent. Instead, we become ever more closely entangled in uh, America's web, if you like. Well, let me come on to America in a sec, but let me just follow up. Are you really saying that the, you, you believe the Soviet Union was of a greater direct threat to Australia during the Cold War than China might be in the future? Without a, any doubt whatsoever. The Soviet Union was an imperial power, as Britain had been, France, the European powers generally. Japan had been an imperial power, and also the United States. And the United States has now developed a new kind of imperialism. You know, you don't have bases, you just rotate through. The language has changed, but the policy is not. And uh, it, it's... Uh, um, China has never, I think, been... I mean, people can argue about Tibet, I know, and some of the provinces and the edges of China. But China has not been, through its very ancient history an imperial power in the way those European states, Japan and America, have been imperial powers. I do not believe, with sensible diplomacy on the part of uh, other countries, mm. um, Hugh White has suggested that America should share power over the Pacific and says we should persuade America to do so. Well, it would be wonderful if we could, but America doesn't make policy that way. They make policy amongst themselves, mm. And then they consult with alleged special friends. And that consultation is really no more than persuading special friends that what they have already decided is the right policy. Well, let me in other words, we have no influence in that. Thank you. Well, let me ask you on that, on that subject of China. Um, I showed you before a review that Hugh White had published uh, in the American Review on your book, and he says that you're too soft on China, which for Hugh is actually saying quite a lot. Um, when you think about... Uh, I take your point about China not having an imperial history, but when you think about Chinese behaviour in the last year, when you think about, for example, the unilateral declaration of an air defence identification zone... Have you looked at the uh, air defence zones around the United States? Mm -hmm. You have? Yeah, it's, it's not unusual for countries to have air defence no, identification zones. But, and they don't consult but, with others in relation to them. No, but you know that the unilateral declaration of that zone over those disputed waters with those very intense rivalries, you must, you must, you must think that was a provocative act by China? Uh, I also think, well, yes, if you like, I'll concede you that. But um, have you read the protocols relating to air defence zones? Tell me about them. Well, uh, the uh, civil aircraft have to declare. America told its civilian aircraft to abide by the rules. Japan and Korea both said, no, we're not going to abide by the rules, and very quietly they were forced to reverse. Mm. America flew a, a bomber through, and I'll bet most of its electronics were turned off because they wouldn't have wanted to provoke something. But... Under the protocols, military aircraft do not have to mm. give any notice. Okay, but... And I... so an air defence zone, what it means, I'm not too damn sure, um, but uh, it doesn't inhibit uh, 
military aircraft activity. Mm. Um, but, uh, you know, if you want provocation, when you have uh, USS Washington stationed in, in, a, in a Japanese harbour, an Australian frigate as part of its escort service for four months of last year, and again, I think it will be this year, um, stooging up and down the East and South China Seas in sight of the Chinese mainland, is that a provocative act? When the Chinese have an equivalent aircraft carrier, which they may do unless they decide they can sink them too easily and they're not worth having. Mm. But if they could and sailed a carry up and down the east coast of the United States, America would go paranoid. They wouldn't know how to control it or handle it. But, but let me ask you this. I wasn't really just asking you about the air defence identification zone. Most experts who follow China, including Hugh, would say that in the last year or two, there has been a significant uptick in Chinese assertiveness. You can talk about the air defence identification and, zone. And in Japan. I could, I'll ask you about Japan in a sec. I could ask you about whether it's appropriate or why you think China uh, chose to station a state-owned oil rig in the South China Sea off the coast of Vietnam, for example. There's a lot of specific examples I could ask you about, but doesn't it really add up to a China um, that is changing and that a China is becoming, that is becoming more assertive? And doesn't that contain some risks for Australia? I don't think it contains any risks for Australia. It might contain some risks for some of the countries on the periphery of China and what they think is theirs and what they think is not. But one of the problems with um, Americans, a lot of Europeans, very few are like Helmut Schmidt or Henry Kissinger and look at things from the perspective of history, tradition and culture. And China went through a period of maximum weakness around the time of the Boxer Rebellion and in the years before that and afterwards for reasons that we all know. And it was... You know, the unequal treaties then imposed on China by the European and Japanese and American powers uh, at some point all going to be redressed. Well, most have been. The Sendaku Islands, as the Japanese call them, were taken from China in 1895 after a war with Japan, uh, China-Japan, and incorporated by act of the Japanese cabinet into Japan. Before that, they were Chinese, and this has been well reported in the New York Times. Um, that, of course, has not been redressed. And uh, before President Obama went to Japan last time, he was saying well, he's got no position in relation to this, but they should negotiate about it. Instead, he gave a cast-iron guarantee that the nuclear defence guarantee will apply to those islands as well as to the mainland of Japan and the other islands. And I think that was a major mistake. He should have got um, Japan to accept that there is a dispute and accept that they should negotiate with China or subject it to international arbitration. Now, China mightn't have accepted either of that, but at least it would have been a step in the right direction instead of a very significant step, and from China's point of view, a provocative step in the wrong direction. So Hugh White wrote in an article not so long ago that Chinese assertiveness could itself be the Chinese response to the American pivot. America is saying, here we are, we're going to strengthen all our military, we're going to make you safe, you only have to rely on us. And he was saying that China might well be just demonstrating to countries like Vietnam and the Philippines that America has some words of comfort, but not much else. Now, I don't know if that's right or if that's wrong. I don't know. But that you... was Hugh's view in that particular article. Mm. So... Well, let me come back to the pivot, because I, I, I would take issue with the way you characterise it in your book. But let me ask you about Japan. Uh, the Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe is in Australia at the moment. Mm. Um, you've been critical of some aspects of um, the changing Japanese defence policy and the relationship, I think, between Australia and Japan. Let me ask you two questions. What did you think of his speech to the federal parliament yesterday? Mm. 
And secondly, why shouldn't Japan uh, reinterpret its constitution so that it can uh, act in collective self-defence? Well, it can act in its own self-defence. We know that. But it really means that Japan can also, if it wants to, send troops to, as allies of the United States to invade a country like Korea. The reinterpretation carries that connotation also, uh, and that is not collective self-defence. It's just an act of gross stupidity on America's part, as it was on ours. Um, the, uh, the speech in the Parliament... Well, he's the second head of state, head of government, who's made a speech that should have only been made from his own soil. The first was President Obama, when he made a speech that should only have been made from, Australian, uh, from, from American soil, or from soil which he thought, you know, there's a view in America that Australia is the best of allies, because we'll do what America wants when America wants it, and won't even ask any questions. And that's pretty accurate. Um, and Obama's speech in the Parliament about the pivot was misguided and wrong. And when Abe... In what sense? What, what did he say specifically that was misguided and wrong? Because it was a major announcement of American policy from Australian soil as though Australian soil was American soil. And, you know, if you, can't, if you can't understand that, well, then you can't understand what being Australian means. Well, I think I can understand what being Australian means. Um, I, I would say to you that for decades, Australians have been, Australian leaders and have been... Did, I, I didn't finish the other part of your question. Well, uh, well you've asked... Abe, Abe shouldn't, have, um, shouldn't have attacked China from Australian soil, and he when, did. How did he do that? Well, I haven't read the speech in full, in detail. I've read the press reports of it. And he was uh, criticising what he calls Chinese assertiveness and aggression. Um, what about his nationalisation of the Sendaku Islands, incorporating them into Japan, what, 18 months ago? He knows quite well that China would regard that, and many others regard that, as a totally aggressive act on the part of Japan. Let me ask you, uh, because the United States is probably the preoccupation, I think it's fair to say, of the book, um, let me... I, I told you I'd ask you some tough questions. Let, let, me, put a, let me put one to I you. I you were just being gentle. I haven't <laughs> started yet. Let, 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 me, <laughs> let, me, let me put this to you. Your book, in its characterisation of the United States, feels very out of date. It feels like a book that should have been published in 2004, not in 2014. You talk a lot about the neoconservatives as though the neoconservatives are running Washington these days, and we know, we know they're not. We know that President Obama is not a muscular unilateralist. He's a cautious realist. In fact, there was an article, a very funny article in the Washington Post yesterday by Dana Milbank, when he said, when it comes to uh, imperial rulers, uh, President Obama is more the Prince of Liechtenstein than he is Alexander the Great. Um, Obama is much more, really, on the model, isn't he, of the sort of cautious realists that you like to cite. Um, if anything, Obama is usually criticised for avoiding the use of force, not for using force. Um, so it seems to me that a lot of the, the criticism of the United States is based on um, the United States of President George W. Bush, and I was the first to say at the time that the invasion of Iraq was wrong. But, but is it really right to, when we're trying to grapple with what the United States' role in the world is now, as opposed to 10 or 15 years ago, is it right to dwell as much as you do on that, on that period? I, I uh, think the ideas of American exceptionalism have uh, really spread and grown significantly since America has been the only superpower. When the Soviet Union existed, the two superpowers, in spite of being some quite sensitive moments, they acted as a restraint on each other. Now, since 1990-91, you had an America that has at times acted totally without restraint, and some would argue totally outside the law. Um, 
the, uh, I don't know if you've read the legal opinion which Obama used to justify drone killing of Americans in Yemen or in other places. But um, it's a very odd legal opinion, and it's not quite as bad as Mr. Justice Yeo about the definition of torture, but it would not be far behind. The question of legality in America, however, is a bit more important because people question it and ask for it and they force the publication of the documents. Um, in Australia, there doesn't seem to be the same concern. We just let it go. All right, the Australians in Yemen, they were nasty people. They were in bad company. Unproven, somebody said so, it doesn't matter. They get killed. They're Australian. Um, the, uh, I, I, I think America, as the only superpower, wants to stay there, wants to... You know, Hugh White says that they have got to give space to China. Now, if he says that, um, how is he going to achieve it? If you can't achieve it, he is really saying, I think, uh, that a provocative Japan, or maybe not a provocative Japan, if you like, a provocative China, causes a conflict between China and Japan. From our point of view, it may not matter which one starts it, but America is then involved. And uh, Obama, in his recent visit, um, made that very clear. If America is involved, we have to be involved. Because we cannot say to the Chinese, with troops in Darwin, a powerful air ground task force, three service task force, which um, can um, demonstrate used power anywhere throughout the region. We can't say we're not complicit. We house the damn thing. Of course we're complicit, and we are also complicit in what Pine Gap has done, which has changed from being a largely defensive um, facility, very useful, very successful in collecting information, but with changed weapons technology has really become an extraordinarily important offensive part of the American military machine and not just for drones, for other strategic and, and, and tactical weapons of, of a very sophisticated kind. And therefore, Pine Gap would be integral to any American conflict in the Northwest Pacific. Uh, if that's there, all right. The law might say, Australian law, but it's a subterfuge, as you well know, that it's an Austra Australian base, but it's not. It's got an American in charge of it. We've got somebody number two, and it serves American purposes. And so it's an American base. Um, I don't know how the numbers fall out between Americans and Australians at the base, but both are there. We are complicit in what it does. And when targeting information goes back to America, and within not quite real time, but within an hour or not much more, a bomb goes off or a drone goes off and people are killed or some other thing is damaged. You know, an Australian Prime Minister says, look, this time we're going to be like Canada. We're not going to join the Americans as we did in Vietnam. We're not going to join the Americans as we did in Iraq. We're going to stand aside. China just would not believe it. So we are involved. We have constitutional capacity to say no but no practical capacity to say no in an effective sense. And it is that which I object to more than anything else. Let me now, whether America is good or America is not so good, as an Australian, I don't want anyone else ever again to have the capacity to take Australia to war, as Britain could take us to war in the First World War and indeed almost certainly in the Second World War. That is an abdication of Australian sovereignty. And if you want that to be returned to Australia and put under Australia's control, and, and, and that's the nub of my book, which a lot of the commentators, and I think Hugh White is, uh, you know, they, people haven't talked about this question. How can we establish the circumstances in which only the Australian government can take us to war on a decision that we make based on our interests not because some other greater power goes to war and we have to follow.
Canada's never put itself in that position. But, but, but why are you so sure that Australia could never make that decision? For example, if there had been a, uh, a Labor government in office during the Iraq war, I'm not at all convinced that Australia would have participated in the Iraq war. Um, they didn't then have the Marines in Darwin. Well, that, 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 that would make no difference to whether we, and, whether we deployed oh, yes, to the Middle East. I mean, well, in the Middle I mean, East, no. no but, Look, but now we're not no, talking about the Middle East. No, but you're making big claims, East. Mr Fraser. You're saying yes. we've abdicated our sovereignty, Australians have no say over whether they go to war, but, but I can imagine plenty of circumstances where Australia would say no. Things have changed since uh, the Iraq war. The Marines are in Darwin. The American, unfortunately, is paying less attention to the Middle East and more to the Western Pacific. And if their diplomacy exercises the same skill in the Western Pacific as they have exercised in the Middle East, well, you might say, who's going to help us? It's not going to be America, because they'll make a mess of it. And we're now talking about our part of the world and the facilities, Pine Gap, you can't say it doesn't exist. You can't say those troops in Darwin don't exist. Apparently, the Prime Minister, when he was in Washington, gave an indication that if you want to increase the number, you can send, what, another task force? We don't know. Maybe a year or two later, they'll take over Laverick Barracks or Townsville or whatever. But um, the, uh, in, a war on the far side of the world is one thing. But a war in our part of the world, and especially one involving China, if it's China and America, there is only one thing for Australia to do in such a contest, and that's to stay out of it. Because if you want to take it further and speculate further, the American technical superiority over the Vietnamese was massive. Just as great, if not greater, than the technical superiority over China. Now, if America couldn't beat Vietnam, do you think they can beat China? Not one hope in a thousand. And Hugh White has recognised that, that America may well not win such a war. And if uh, America loses such a war, it would take 10 or 12 years, but AFC warfare concept, which I'm sure you've studied in detail, all 600 pages of it, published in Washington, um, the, uh, uh, after 10, 12, 14 years, the Americans would get tired of it. They'd go back to the Western Hemisphere. Their trade, their commerce, their investment wouldn't be really greatly affected because these things do not need protection of war. But they would lose military bases throughout countries in the Western Pacific. That would be the price of peace in those circumstances. Then Australia is left here as a defeated ally of a defeated superpower. I think that's rather an uncomfortable position to be in and would put Australia in greater danger than we've ever been in our history, except before Japan attacked Pearl Harbor and saved us. If you think, if the alliance is so dangerous to Australia, why do you think uh, every year the Lowy Institute publishes its Lowy Institute poll? Um, about 80% of Australians say it's either very important or, or somewhat important to our security. Well, of course they say it's important because your political leaders, the Lowy Institute says it's important. And when there is no debate between the political parties... I wish we were that influential, but go on. <laughs> When there is no debate between the political parties, um, uh, habit takes over. Again, Hugh White, you used him against me, I'm now using him in support of me. He said, you know, one of the things uh, is habit. Uh, we, we just go on. We don't recognise that the strategic context in which Australia operates has changed dramatically since the destruction of the Soviet Union the breakup of the Soviet Union. And we have gone on as though uh, the world is comfortable, the same policies will still, still suit us well. We vaguely think that because of the rise of China, there might be danger, but that doesn't matter because America's there, the ANZUS Treaty is there. Uh, 
Um, Actually, let me interrupt. I think it's quite the opposite, isn't it? I mean, isn't it that um, in circumstances where Chinese behaviour is changing much more quickly than most experts would have predicted, when there is a real risk of, or at least significant uncertainty about China's future role in the world, doesn't it make perfect sense to balance against, to hedge against the chance of Chinese recklessness in the future by keeping the United States engaged in our region, by balancing, uh, by providing a counterweight to China. Doesn't that make perfect you, sense you, to you, Australia? You, you, you What's the alternative? You, to, to... you sound like a minister in the Menzies government arguing, <laughs> arguing to, uh, we've got to put people into Vietnam to keep America involved. No, I'm not uh, arguing about putting people in Vietnam. I'm arguing about I'm keeping you, the United you, States you, involved no, in this you, region. You, you, you've sounded like, because Australia is a relatively small country. I mean, for people, resources still, we should be much larger than we are. Um, but that's another question, another subject. The, uh, uh, do we really think we can influence America? America is a major superpower and will do what is in America's interest regardless of what Australia does. They will have their pivot, whether we allow Darwin to be, continue to be their major base and whether we allow Pine Gap to continue to operate as it now is, as an offensive weapon in their armory. Um, even without those things, America is not going to go away because they're on top of the greasy pole and they want to stay there. But relatively, their power, not in, even in their own absolute terms, but relatively to the rest of the world, their power is declining to an extent. It'll be slow and gradual, but a declining superpower through history has always been a little more dangerous than a rising power. And you are making assumptions about China which run against Chinese history, against Chinese tradition, which you do need to take into account if you want to make a valid judgment about what will put Australia least at risk. And that's the kind of judgment that I've tried to make in the book. And people can argue and disagree, as you cl clearly do, and most people in the establishment do, with the conclusions. But uh, what puts Australia least at risk? There's always a risk about the future. There's no cast-iron guarantee. We thought the British Empire could save us, and the British Empire couldn't save us because they'd run out of power, and we should have recognised that long before we did. You think the United States saved us against the Japanese in the Second World War? Well, there's still the unanswered question. And I was speaking to a senior Japanese... Uh, I'm sorry, American uh, officials. I'm not going to mention his name, because you'd recognise it. Um, but very well respected. Without Pearl Harbour, would America have come into the war? You know, when you think of it, Britain was fighting... No, no, no. It, it is a valid question. Because to leave Britain totally beleaguered, fighting alone for two and a half years against Nazi Germany, knowing what Germany was doing to the Jewish population right throughout the whole of Europe, created very real questions about America's future intentions. Now, of course, Roosevelt was trying to persuade Churchill, I'm trying to get America into the war, I'm trying to do it, I'm trying to do it. But after Pearl Harbor, America declared war on Japan. America never declared war on Germany. Germany declared war on America first. And so there is a valid question, what will America regard in its own best interests? We lost... Um, Dick Woolcott might disagree with this, but I'm, I'm not sure. I think we lost a foreign minister when he said that ANZUS would apply to our troops fighting in Borneo. And I've read the transcript of the discussions which involved Menzies, McEwen, Harriman, a couple of other Americans, um, Barwick, and 
McEwen was the one who, towards the end of the discussions, pressed the hard question. At the troops in Borneo were top-grade Indonesian troops, but they were posing as irregulars because it was not a war, it was confrontation. And our army, I was army minister at the time, our army regarded the top 300,000 Indonesians as as good as any. They had about a million and a half in their army and tailed off after that. But the top 300,000, very good, very effective. And Harriman had said, of course, if there's an invasion of Australia, we'd be with you. But McEwen said, it's not the way it's going to be, is it? It'll be infiltration, the sort of thing that's happening in Borneo, in these circumstances. And Harriman, well, Mr. McEwen, you've come to the nub of the issue. But I find in the time remaining, it would not be possible to find words that would give you a sufficiently accurate answer to be able to answer your question at all. Now, you can, if you like, say that that's the politest no you've ever heard in your life. And Barwick, three months later, was in foreign minister. Um, but I know three times in my political lifetime when America has chosen Indonesia over Australia. And there's no reason why they shouldn't continue to choose the largest Islamic country in the world over 23 million Australians, even in spite of Pine Gap and Darwin. I've had my go. I've asked some questions. I've got a few more. I might come back to them, but I also want to give the audience an opportunity. So can I ask who might be asked, interested in asking Mr Fraser a question? I'll ask this gentleman over here first. If you wait for the microphone and state your name and affiliation if, if there is one before you ask your question. Yeah, Mr Fraser, my name is Paul Power and I'm from the Refugee Council of Australia. And perhaps not surprisingly, I'm interested in your views on the, international, the implications for international affairs of current Australian policy um, and in relation to refugees. And also, um, if you're advising the government, where you would uh, suggest we take our policy in re relation to refugees from here, particularly in relation to our uh, partnerships or relationships in Southeast Asia and South Asia? Well, if that's another question, I'd sooner keep on the book. I'm not going to run away from it. Um, there would be some dramatic changes in policy. We wouldn't practice piracy in the high seas and capture a boat in international waters and take everyone off it. Um, there'd be many, many things that would be changed. If you want to see what the pattern of change might be, look to the way we handled a very large exodus, very, very much larger than anything that's happened in recent times, out of Indochina in the 70s and early 1980s. I mean, people were processed offshore because um, to um, try and stop boats coming through the Indonesian archipelago, which was dangerous, not only in unseaworthy boats, but also from Indonesian pirates, so Malaysia was persuaded to allow a lot to be processed on Malaysian soil, but on condition that we were going to take very large numbers out of that centre. And America and Canada also took very large numbers, so then um, Malaysia wasn't left with a problem that they would not be able to handle. They had initially started to push boats back out to sea, and we had to act quickly to try and stop that. Um, but that will give you a pattern. But then you've got to take the issue way beyond our region because the numbers could get larger than we'd handle. So, you know, can America and Canada again be involved? Can New Zealand be more involved? We've been secretary um, on the Security Council. We could have tried to reinvigorate the world. We could have paid a bit more attention to the huge numbers hitting Greece, Italy, Spain, France. Anyway, um, I'd certainly want a different minister. I think I saw Rory Medcalf with his hand. Thanks very much. Uh, Mr Fraser, Rory Medcalf from the, um, the Lowy Institute, and um, I've um, 
I've, I've read your book and uh, I respect the, the fact that you've contributed um, uh, your experience to the debate in this way. Um, I have to say that I uh, personally I disagree quite strongly with uh, not only your conclusions but much of the analysis underlying the conclusions. And I think, uh, to me, there are, there are distortions and omissions in the analysis that, um, that damage the credibility of the conclusion that really we could do with a much reduced American strategic role in Asia. The, the key point I wanted to go to, or the question uh, that I wanted to go to, if, if I may, Mr Fraser, is about Southeast Asia. Um, in your book, you, you make, a, I think, a case that uh, really the countries of Southeast Asia, of, of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN, uh, would rather get on with managing their problems with China by themselves without uh, American support and involvement. My, my strong sense is that at least five substantial ASEAN countries, Indonesia, Malaysia, Vietnam, the Philippines and indeed Singapore, have become uh, more worried about China in recent years, more comfortable with an American role. The fact that Singapore hosted uh, Japanese uh, Prime Minister Abe recently uh, for the Shangri-La Dialogue I think is a very strong uh, signal of that. So it strikes me as, um, as a bit confusing that you would argue uh, that somehow these countries would, be, would prefer to solve their problems over the South China Sea or other issues with China without a, um, a strong American presence in, in the region. I appreciate your, um, your view on that. The point, the point I was making in relation to ASEAN, that these were countries that had, in many cases, been former enemies. They'd formed an association that was growing in strength and growing in usefulness. Uh, certainly, they still had some problems between them, but largely they were managing those problems or if you like, putting them into deep freeze so that the association as such was not uh, uh, going to be damaged. And I think that they have done this over the years remarkably successfully and, if you like, in their own way. Um, from the very beginning, Indonesia was saying to both superpowers, keep out. We're not aligned. We don't want to be dragged one way or another. And Strangely enough, the superpowers at that time largely um, uh, defended that. Now, you, um, you, you took a view of Singapore, and that's the traditional view of the Singapore government. It's very difficult for those in positions of authority who've adopted a habit of mind over decades, if you like, and this includes Australia, to change and recognise the strange changed strategic context. But I heard Go Chok Tong um, two years ago in Tianjin before a, a meeting representing 20 countries from not just Asia but around the world saying that containment will not work, it is dangerous and it cannot succeed. Um, he didn't elaborate to a great extent but his words were in his way, pretty emphatic, and for a Singaporean, and a Singaporean who had been Prime Minister, I think he might have got, um, well, he hasn't repeated it, so maybe somebody said something to him when he got back to Singapore, but that, no doubt, was what he felt. Um, I think ASEAN, left to itself, would still be remarkably successful and better able to negotiate a code of conduct in the South China Sea and that every time America says, hope China gets on with it, as Joe, uh, Vice President Biden did a while ago and repeated it and somebody else has repeated it, um, that would probably make it harder to negotiate with China in today's context. Um, you, you know, for, for I haven't been to China for two years. When I was there, the common question, which America do we believe, this economic and strategic dialogue led by Hillary Clinton or the pivot and the military build-up? I mean, America is trying to have it both ways. They're saying they want cooperation, collaboration, and then in case they don't get their own way in that, they're bringing in more guns. Which America do we believe? And, you know, it, it's, um, pe people are, 
I also had Chinese saying to me, we don't want America to leave because we know China's strength makes countries in our periphery nervous. But there's a difference to maintaining the status quo and very substantially increasing a military build-up and trying to contain China in the way the Soviet Union ultimately was contained. Uh, I want to come back to this question of containment, because you do use the word a lot. But let me just follow up on Rory's question. I mean, you said these are habits of mind that people are finding it hard to shake, and that's what you said in relation to Australian policymakers too. But it's not a habit of mind for Vietnam, which fought a war against the United States, which you helped to prosecute, of course. That is turning Vietnam... And, and making Vietnam worried about Southeast Asia. That's not a habit of mind. Isn't, this, isn't it the fact that, that at least these five countries that Rory mentioned are nervous? They are worried about changes that, that, that they detect in China's behaviour. That's why they're moving closer to America, not because of habits of mind. Well, I'm not sure that Vietnam is really moving closer to America. When Panetta tried to get use of Cameron Bay for the American Navy as some sort of rotating through or base again, the Vietnamese very politely said, well, anyone's welcome here, but they weren't going to let it turn into an American rotating through or base. And the Vietnamese have had a very long history of um, living alongside a larger and more powerful China, and they've often found it very awkward. There's nothing to suggest that that is going to change. And the Vietnamese have been very tough, very resilient, and well able to look after themselves. Um, I think they'll come to a time when they realize that American involvement, and as China would see it, um, American provocation throughout the region is itself creating uncertainty because there's a push back and again, you quoted Hugh White against me, let him me again quote him on my side. He has said that this, these actions by the Chinese can well be in part a response to the American policy of containment or the pivotal rebalancing to try and demonstrate to the neighbours that America is not going to be able to do much. And the Vietnamese, above all, I think, will know that and understand that because they're well and truly on the mainland and they're well and truly a neighbour. Um, but that's a concern they have had through history. They've been with it all their lives. But on this question of the pivot, um, I think it's true that when Obama gave the speech in November 2011 to the Australian Parliament that, that you criticised... I think it's true that there and was, Keating, and, and my former boss, Paul Keating, also criticised it, um, there, was, there, there was uncertainty and perhaps even anxiety in Beijing about what the pivot meant. But in the two and a half years since, the truth is that the pivot has run out of puff. The truth is that if you go to Beijing now, if you, you mentioned you haven't been for two years, but if you go now, most, most Chinese analysts are not at all concerned about the rebalance. In fact... The weakness of the rebalance is making them think that America is vulnerable. It's not uh, the, the sort of the containment scenario that you describe in your book where this all-powerful America is moving the guns into place. I think when you look at um, the military elements of the rebalance are pretty underwhelming, I would say, uh, on the grand historical scheme of things. The political elements of the pivot are very unclear. You have, uh, I often quote the fact that John Kerry visited the Middle East, I think it was 14 times last year, and he, he visited Asia three or four times. The numbers are something like that. Uh, the United States is clearly distracted by problems overseas and by problems at home. The economic elements of the rebalance, um, in particular the, the, the TPP, are also unclear. So one aspect of the book that I found a bit perplexing was that you, you set up this straw man of a rampant America uh, influenced by neoconservatives and pivoting towards Asia. But I think most analysts in the region would say that the pivot is running out of puff. Well, I don't think um, Obama would say it's running out of puff or the Secretary of State would say it's running out of puff. It was always going to be a long-term move. It was never going to be something that, you know, like a hot knife running through butter. And... Um, 
you know, if you think it's running matter powerful, maybe um, my concerns will be reduced and America will not be so provocative in the future. Okay, I'm anxious. I don't, I don't agree with you. <laughs> I, thought, I thought I had you for a second there. Yeah? I'll take this lady here and then, then this gentleman in the third row. Thanks. Uh, Deborah Snow, uh, Mr. Fraser from VFX. Um, you're looking in very fine fetal, might I say. Um, could I just ask you to uh, talk a little bit more about your characterisation of Australia's latest intervention on the high seas as an act of, of piracy? Could you spell out for us what you think the ramifications of that might be and whether others are also seeing it in that light? Um, the second question I'd just like you to quickly touch on as well is that you referred a moment ago to the US choosing Indonesia over Australian interests three times, um, I think, in your lifetime as a, as a politician and an observer of foreign affairs. Could you go into that in a little more detail as well, please? Um, well, I, I thought that if a ship was sailing in the high seas, freedom of the seas meant it was able to continue sailing if it's in international waters to be uh, apprehended by an Australian customs vessel or naval vessel, people taken off it and all the rest. What do you call it? Kidnapping? Piracy? It certainly is in breach of international law. Um, and um, the, it hasn't been much reported here, but Reuters yesterday morning reported a police chief in uh, uh, Sri Lanka is saying that all the passengers who had been returned, the 41, I think, were going to be prosecuted for leaving the country illegally. <laughs> and it would probably be not very difficult to prove that. And if found guilty, he said, they'd all be subject to enhanced imprisonment. What's enhanced imprisonment? Is that a new name for torture? It sounded very like it. Um, on the other thing... Australia had wanted a genuine act of self-determination for West Irian, West Papua, um, and especially ex-servicemen in the parliament were adamant about that. The Australian government supported it and argued for it very strongly, and we were way, way out on the limb because the Dutch didn't want it, the Portuguese didn't want it, the British was not going to support us, and they made that very plain, and America was not going to support it. And in the end, we had to settle for an act of self-determination, as did the people of West Papua, for something that was symbolism only and meaning nothing. Well, that was... Uh, I've given the example over um, troops fighting in Borneo during confrontation. And uh, the, um, there was a very... When, when John Howard acted in relation to East Timor, um, and partly because uh, Habibi short-circuited the time scale from 10 years to a few months, which, if you knew Habibi, he was bound to do. And I, I've met him several times over the years and continue to do so. Um, but then we had a, a job of sort of maintaining peace. We needed a bit of heavy lift capacity. It took a lot of pushing in several days before the United States would agree to supply that heavy lift capacity, which we did not have, and certainly should have had, and we should have been spending more money on defense. Um, but we didn't have, and we couldn't have done it without their support. Um, now, what were they doing in those few days when they did not say yes. Um, they were clearing their lines, I have no doubt, with Jakarta. But that's not unreasonable, is it? I mean, they did I mean, say it's yes totally in the end. totally unreasonable. We're meant to, you're saying we're a special friend, a special ally. They knew quite well that what John Howard was doing would fail abysmally without that heavy lift capacity. But they did provide that, didn't they? In the end, after a great deal of pushing, and very reluctantly as you know. Let me ask you, before I go to this gentleman, on the defence budget um, issue, you mentioned Australia's defence budget. Um, if Australia were to follow your policy prescriptions, if we were to give the United States, I think you advocate five years to uh, vacate Pine Gap, 
uh, if we were to... I'd pull Australians out of there and say they're going to be out by Christmas. The Americans can fill them up, but there's not going to be any further Australian involvement in drone killings or targeting American weapon systems. If we took those steps, the steps in relation to Darwin and others, we would be signalling, we'd be sending a very strong signal to the Americans about, about the alliance. And one way or another, it would, it would probably end um, in the dissolution of the alliance. Um, do you think, what, in those circumstances, how much more uh, would Australia and should Australia spend on defence? Do you agree that if we were not in alliance with the United States, it would be incumbent upon us to spend a much larger portion of our GDP on defence? Uh, well, I, in the book, I make it quite plain. I think we should probably spend about double, 3% uh, of GNP. Uh, I think a number of European states spend something around that figure. Um, countries that are not basically as well off as we are. We have as the Americans charge us with. We've uh, uh, ridden, had a cheap ride because of the alliance. But you know, you, you, you ought to... I don't know how many people ever read the ANZUS Treaty. There is one firm, an absolute commitment in it, and that is a commitment to consult. And then, if there's agreement, other things could follow but it could only follow in accordance with one's constitutional processes. Now, if we're thinking there might be uh, help from America, that, as I understand it, would need a war powers resolution through Congress. Now, NATO doesn't need that because the treaty itself makes it quite plain an attack on one and an attack on all. It's a different kind of treaty. But the ANZUS Treaty is... Uh, the commitment is a commitment to consult and material support may follow. You cannot say more than that. It's also worth noting that every war in which we've supported America has not been covered by ANZUS, has not been part of ANZUS, has been outside the geographic limits of ANZUS. And uh, it's restricted to the forces or territories of, it was the three powers, it's now both powers, in the Pacific theatre, and that's the limit of the geographic bounds of ANZUS. It does not apply beyond that. So whatever we've done in Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, it's got nothing to do with ANZUS. Um, and so ANZUS is a very limited treaty, a very limited cover. Certainly a network has grown up under it, but that is a network that I question whether it serves Australia's interest. I don't question whether it serves America's interests. It most certainly does. That's very obvious. But would it, at the end of the day, serve Australia's interests? And my, you know, you can say it may. But the future is balancing risk. What is the least risky course for Australia? And I believe there is a greater risk in staying with current arrangements than in having a much greater degree of strategic independence. And if America wanted to say, well, that ends the alliance as a whole, you know, it would depend on how, well, I don't know, vengeful, how annoyed, how piqued the uh, Americans were. But, you know, if, if they were prepared to accept that we cannot have any facilities on Australian soil that imply we are complicit in their warlike actions if we don't want to join that war. If they were prepared to accept that as a basic principle of the alliance and then we adjust things, which would obviously mean adjusting Darwin Pine Gap and maybe the new purposes for which Northwest Cape is used, um, the, um, then uh, an alliance could continue, but I suspect that they would not do that, that they would want us out in the cold. Um, but I, you know, I don't believe they're going to tell their corporation to disinvest from Australia. We might have some economic price to pay. Um, are they going to say we, they won't sell us military equipment? 
well, their companies will want to sell the military equipment, and if not, there's good military equipment made in other places, and even in Japan. So presumably we could buy Japanese equipment now under the new arrangements that Japan's adopted. We, we have, we're almost out of time. I did promise I'd go to this gentleman, but I'm going to ask you to ask your question very quickly, if you don't mind, the gentleman on the third row. No, I'm sorry. This is the last question we have time for. Thank you. Not very loudly. Thank you. You could use that microphone, sir. I'm going to have to ask you to ask a very quick question, I'm sorry, because we're almost out of time, as I said. Um, Just come to your question, if you would. Well, the question that I really want to get to is this. Um, as China emerges as a super, potential superpower, can you envisage the time in the relatively short term where China's emergence as a superpower will contribute rather than detracting from peace and stability? because of its countervailing force as a superpower, which currently we only have one. Thank With you very China, much. we might have two. Thank you. I, I, I think that's problematic, because unless there can be a change in America, I would see... Um, look, the most likely spark for a conflict is Japan, in my view. I don't think China wants war. They've got too much to do in their own land, building up the standard of life of still too many people who live very close to the poverty line. Um, and you know, one, one thing China has been totally consistent on, um, in my memory anyway, the opposition to hegemony, whether it was Soviet hegemony, American hegemony, or anyone else's hegemony, as they call it. And there's no reason to believe that that is not an article of faith. It demonstrates why they don't like military interventions in other countries and often vote against them in the United Nations and whatever, or in the Security Council. But, um, look, it, it, I'm not sure that I can see far enough ahead, really, to give uh, an answer. But if America were prepared to accept that, or to treat China with respect, to treat China as an equal, if... Japan were prepared to apologise for the rape of Nanking and maybe give some rational reason why Japanese schoolchildren aren't taught of Japanese atrocities doing across China when every Chinese school child is taught of those atrocities. Um, the, you know, a lot of things could change. An apology, a, a proper apology for the rape of Nanking... One of my Japanese friends took me up on this and they sent me about 20 pages of gobbledygook and not one word of it could be said to be regarded as an honest, decent apology for one of the most terrible atrocities that's occurred anywhere. Um, that, that would start to change the environment. Japan has managed to put itself and make itself into the aggrieved party when it's got no right to be. China was the aggrieved party. And we have, or America, has sided unequivocally with the then aggressor against the then aggrieved party. I, I don't think our current world leadership in pretty well any country that I can think of pays anything like enough attention to history, to culture, to tradition, to things which are deep in the heart of you know, Kissinger would, and he wrote recently about the Ukraine, he wrote about earlier about the movement of NATO eastward. Um, and he always understood the importance of history and culture and um, of a country's past. And um, for China, if you ask people about the early days in China, they don't go back to Chairman Mao. They say, you know, how far back do you want to go? How many thousand years? Communism is just a button on whatever. 
of China's continuum. And if we really understood how to treat China with respect, or if America did, that would make a huge difference. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank Malcolm Fraser uh, for a, a number of things today. First of all, um, for coming to the Lowy Institute. Uh, the Lowy Institute is happy to ventilate these kinds of issues and to be the forum for this kind of debate. Uh, I'd like to thank him for contributing to these important debates, not only on Twitter, but um, by taking the time and the effort to, to, uh, to author a book of this substance and something that is deserving of a lot of attention. Uh, I think you can tell, Malcolm, um, the interest in your work from the, the packed room and the TV cameras and the, and the questions from the journalists. And finally, I want to thank you um, uh, for characterising me as being something like a, a minister in the Menzies government. <laughs> this, will, this will further... This will... I, I was trying to say something flattering. No, no. This, <laughs> this will further confuse my critics who usually characterise me as a, a dewy-eyed Keatingite. Uh, or, or a, uh, a stooge of the CIA. So thank you. Foreign policy was great. <laughs> thank you very much. Something we can agree on. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. We have, as a gift for Mr. Fraser, we have a couple of wonderful Lowy Institute in, uh, publications that I'd also urge everybody here to buy. Uh, we have the first in our beautiful new Lowy Institute papers. This is called Beyond the Boom by John Edwards, who is Paul Keating's economics advisor. It's a positive, optimistic take on the Australian economy. And secondly, this edited volume reports from a turbulent decade, which contains uh, a lot of um, very lively, compelling, fresh arguments from the Institute over our first 10 years. Ladies and gentlemen, before you go, can I invite you to consider attending an event on the 29th of July at which Anthony Bubalo, my colleague, will be convening a discussion of foreign correspondents, including Zoe Daniel from the ABC and Stan Grant from Sky. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you again for coming and thank you, Malcolm Fraser. Thank you very much. Thank you. There you go. Thank you.